Hi, I'm Walt and this is Delta Astrophotography. On this channel, we take photographs of space and I show you how to do it. In this video, we're gonna animate our astrophotography by doing time lapses and star trail animations. And maybe we just might debunk flat earth in the process. So join us in today's episode of Space Madness. <laughs> Time lapses and star trails are actually a great way to view the rotation of the Earth. And luckily, they're very easy to do and they don't require a bunch of expensive crap. All right, now for the equipment. And don't let this scare you. We're not gonna use anything like this. We just need a DSLR or mirrorless camera that can go full manual mode and a wide angle lens. This is the 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens that came with the camera. The camera is a Canon T5i, also known as the 700D. We want this wide angle lens because we want a big wide shot so we can see as many stars as possible. Next, we need a tripod. Any tripod will do. We just don't wanna to be touching our camera because not only are we gonna be doing long exposures, but we're gonna be taking hundreds of photos of the same shot and we don't wanna to touch the camera at all. And finally, we need an intervalometer. It's a little remote that tells your camera how many photos to take. And I'll talk more about how to use it in just a few minutes. Just when you buy an intervalometer, make sure you get one that's for your specific camera. In order to photograph the stars, you're going to need to get away from light pollution. So get as far away from a city as possible. Check out a light pollution map and see which areas are close to you that have low light pollution. Another source of light pollution is the moon. So you're gonna to have to learn the moon phase and go out near the new moon when there's no moon out at night. And finally, you cannot shoot the stars when the clouds are out, so also make sure you check the weather. Geez, you have to get out of the city, wait for the new moon phase, and the weather has to be absolutely perfect? No wonder people never get out and look at the stars anymore. We're gonna be taking multiple pictures to use as a time-lapse. And the trick to getting time-lapses is using what's called an intervalometer. This is basically a remote that tells your camera how many pictures to take. And we're gonna be taking hundreds. It can also control the shutter speed of your camera if you wanna do exposures longer than 30 seconds. Let's just take a quick look at how this thing works. The first setting over here is called delay. That's just how long your camera's gonna wait before it starts taking its first picture. The next setting, called long, that's how long your shutter speed is, your exposure time. You can go anywhere from one second to several hundred seconds. The next section is called interval. It's how long it's gonna wait between your photos. Right now it's set to 59 seconds, that's ridiculous. There, I got it to three seconds. I don't wanna wait 59 seconds between each exposure. The next setting over here, N, is number. That's how many photos you want your camera to take. Anywhere from one to 399. And I guess the last setting is just a beep noise. Let's talk about Flat Earth for a minute. Your, Your tire's, tire's flat. flat. Damn it, I'll have to deal with that later. So I don't really have anything against Flat Earthers. You can believe what you wanna believe, but some Flat Earthers really do think that space is fake and photographs of space are all fake, photoshopped, CGI, and I, I've gotta say that that's just not the case. Um, I am an amateur astrophotographer and I do take photos of space from my yard and this channel is all about teaching you how to do that as well. And for this video, I'm not just gonna show you some weird uh, round earth proof and expect you to believe me, it's all about teaching you how to do it. So you can show everybody what you see with your own eyes and your camera. All that said, there's some flat earth ideas that just don't seem to coincide with reality and we're gonna break that down for a second. The main thing we're gonna talk about in this video today is how to photograph and animate the stars and see how they really move as opposed to how the flat earth model says they should move. You're wasting, wasting your, time. your time. It's, it's flat. flat. I've, I've seen, seen it. it. Oh yeah? Okay, so let's really break this down. When we see things in the sky, we always observe them moving from east to west. Same on a globe. Things rise in the east and then they set in the west. Now where this model really starts to fall apart is when we try to look north and south. Here we have a definitive north that way and a definitive south that way. South doesn't really work here. On a globe, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere and you look due north, you should actually see stars rotating around you like this. And if you're in the South, you should see the exact same thing. Southern Hemisphere, you should see stars rotating around you in a circle like this. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere and looking South, you're not gonna be able to see the center of this circle down here, but you should at least be able to see the top of it. Whereas here, no matter how far South you go, you should only ever see stars moving from east to west. 
So let's go get our cameras and see what we actually do see up there. Okay, so that's annoying. My best tripod was stolen recently along with my favorite camera and lens. And my backup tripod apparently is missing the piece that attaches to the camera, so I couldn't use it either. So I had to bring out this star tracker with a ball head on top, and I'm basically just using it as a glorified tripod. If it looks weird, you don't need to use anything like this. Any good old fashioned tripod will do the job. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Before we do anything, we need to make sure that our camera and our lens are switched to full manual mode. Okay, now that that's done, we need to focus our lens to infinity so everything will be in focus. It can be kind of tricky, but basically we point our camera at a star and then we turn on our live view screen, try to get that star in there and turn our focus ring until the star shrinks to a small pinpoint of light. If you're already really out of focus, this can be kind of difficult. Maybe try to focus on a street light in the distance if you have one of those, that's good practice. You can even maybe use autofocus on the street light, but then switch back to manual focus when you're focusing on that star. Before we focus on anything, we want our live view screen to be as bright as possible when we turn it on. And in order to do that, we're gonna set our main camera settings to something that'll make things very bright. We're gonna do a 30 second shutter speed, the lowest F number for our aperture we can go, and the highest ISO number we can go. You can't really even see it, but there's actually a star on this live view screen. And we're gonna hit the zoom buttons on the camera to zoom in on it. There it is. It's very fuzzy. So we turn our focus ring until it's a very small pinpoint of light, just like that. When we get it to this small pinpoint, we are at infinity focus. Now that we're good and focused, I'm gonna go ahead and point my camera north, directly north, and I'm gonna to try to get a little foreground and sky in the same framing. So north is actually directly behind me, and that's my neighbor's house back there. Not the best foreground, but I'm really too lazy to go anywhere else right now. Once I've got everything framed up the way I like it, it's time to dial up our main camera settings for the shoot. Camera settings, yay! Yeah. Where do you guys come from? For our main camera settings, we are gonna use a 30 second exposure, but instead of using the camera to do the exposure time, we're gonna use our intervalometer to do it. So I'm gonna switch it over to bulb mode. We're gonna leave the aperture the same, and I'm just gonna drop my ISO down to about 800. Typically for astrophotography, you wanna save your files as raw files, but since we're gonna be taking so many files, it is okay to go ahead and change that to JPEG. But if you have the storage space and the processing power for it, by all means, save your files as raw files as they are non-compressed and can be edited a lot better. And now that I've got 30 seconds dialed up on my intervalometer, we're gonna go ahead and take our first test shot. Let's have a look at that. All right, you know what? That's gonna be good for now. We've got a foreground and we've got a sky full of stars. Now that we've got our shot framed up and focused and everything the way we like it with the camera settings dialed in the way we want, I'm gonna take the intervalometer and program it to take as many shots as possible. It looks like for this intervalometer, 399 is its max. So we're gonna set it to 399, get it rolling, and pretty much go inside until the battery on the camera dies. Now let's get into the processing part of our tutorial. This is when we take our photos and actually animate them. For this, we'll need Adobe's photography plan, which is about $10 a month. It comes with Lightroom and Photoshop. In Lightroom, we'll save all our photos as a sequence, so each photo can be used as a individual frame in a video. We'll use Photoshop just to create a video out of our frames, and that's it. And finally, we'll use a free software called StarStacks that's going to make star trails for us. It's available for both Mac and Windows. I'll leave a link in the description below for that. Once you get everything downloaded and installed, let's jump into the computer and get to editing. All right, now we're in Lightroom. I've got all my photographs from the session open up in here and I'm on the develop tab. This session was actually from a few months ago, but it's pretty much the exact same thing. I just used a 24 millimeter lens instead of the kit lens. But as you can see, my ISO was 800 using a 24 millimeter lens, aperture F3.2 and shutter speed of 30 seconds. 
One thing you'll notice is my foreground is pretty illuminated and that's because of a very dim porch light on this house. A lot of times when you're photographing in the middle of nowhere, your, fo your foreground's very dark, maybe even just a silhouette. So I kind of got lucky with that. But if you want to make any kind of color adjustments to your sequence, now's the time to do it. If you saved your files as raw files instead of JPEGs, this process will be a lot easier. It'll look better, but that's fine if you save things as JPEGs, this will still work. My big problem with this is the temperature is just too warm. Everything's really orange. So I'm just going to cool this down a little bit by sliding the temperature knob over to blue. See, that looks a lot better in my opinion. The house down here is a little blown out and funny looking, so I can kind of correct that a bit with this tool right here, the graduated filter. I'm going to click that, and come down to the bottom and slide this up and adjust the temperature of just the bottom of the photograph. I'm going to warm that back up. That looks a little better, but the house is kind of blown out in certain areas, so we'll drop the highlights down. That looks better. Increase the shadow slider. And really that's it for that. I'm gonna hit done. I may bring up some noise reduction on the overall photo to clean it up. And that's all the color edits I'm gonna do. The next thing we need to do is really important because we are making a video. And most videos are cropped to 16 by nine. We just want it to fit our TV screen. So we need to crop the photo 16 by nine. So I'm gonna click crop here. And right by this little lock here, I'm gonna click on it and we're gonna switch to 16 by nine. 1920 by 1080, that's movie format. I'm gonna make sure I get plenty of stars in there when I'm adjusting my crop here. That crop looks good to me, I'm gonna hit done. There we go. Now, we need to do that to every single one of the other photos. So I'm gonna make sure this photo is selected, the very first one, the one that I edited. I'm gonna come all the way down here to the end. And as you can see, I took 398 photographs. I'm gonna hold shift and click the last one. Now all my photos are selected and I'm gonna hit sync. We're gonna make sure everything is checked, especially crop. Just make sure everything's checked and we're gonna hit synchronize. All right, now that all of our photos have the exact same color and crop edits, we're going to save them as a sequence. They need to be in order because we're going to be making a video. File, export, choose the folder you want your stuff saved in. I don't know who Tyler is. Um, I've already got it set to uh, time-lapse test. Come down here to file settings and make sure we're saving as JPEGs because we're going to be creating a lot of files. This is really gonna help save space and processing power. Now we're gonna file naming, come to custom settings, click it and select sequence. Now that sequence is selected right here, we'll come down to edit and right here by the word sequence, we see a number one. I'm gonna double click that maybe even triple click it. Click it enough times to where this comes up. And we're gonna select sequence 0001. That's just because we have a lot of files. We wanna make sure nothing gets messed up. So 0001, click that. We can give our sequence a name under custom text. Click that and just say lapse and click done. That was probably the most complicated part of this whole process. It gets easier from here. So now we're just gonna click export and we're done with Lightroom. The next thing we want to do is open up Photoshop and when we're in here, we'll click open right here. Navigate to the folder where we saved all our images. You can see they're all numbered in a nice little sequence here. We're gonna click the first one and come down here to image sequence and check that and hit open. Choose your desired frame rate, whether it's 24 frames a second, 29.97, 30 frames per second. I'm going with 29.97. You could probably go with 24 frames per second to make your lapse even longer, but this is what we're sticking with. I'm gonna hit okay. Now we've got our video opened up in here. We might wanna go to window at the top and click timeline so we can see our timeline down here. And if you actually try to play your video within Photoshop, it's gonna be really jerky. So let's just go ahead and export it by going to file, export, render video. I'm going to select the folder I want to save my video in. Got a time-lapse folder right here. Leave everything pretty much like it is. Um, for preset, I'm going to select YouTube 1080p. And that's it. I'll just click render. We're going to sit here and let it do its thing. Okay, now that that's done, we're going to go ahead and close out of Photoshop. And before we look at the time-lapse video, we're going to make a different kind of animation called a star trail animation. Close out Photoshop. And we're going to open up star stacks. I'm going to go back to the folder where we saved our image sequence. So we're back here again. 
And we're going to select all of our images and drag them here. Close this. Now that we have all our images loaded up in star stacks, I'm just going to come over here to blending. I like to choose gap filling. Don't want comment mode and save image after each step. That's very important. I'm going to select where it's saved to. I'm going to create a subfolder here. I'm going to call it trails and choose that folder. And we're just going to come up to the top and click this button right here that says start processing. And what it's going to do is it's going to stack each image on top of each other and create star trail. The more images that are stacked together, the longer the trails are going to look and the more we can actually see the motion of what's going on up there. Each time an image is saved, it is saved with all the images before it stacked on top of it. Okay, now it's done. We've got a nice little preview of a star trail image, which is pretty good on its own, but let's make it into an animation. We're gonna go back into Photoshop and do the same thing we did with the time lapse. Okay, in Photoshop, we're gonna click open and we're gonna open the star trails folder that we just made. Click on the first image, hit image sequence and open. I'm gonna choose my frame rate, hit okay. And once again, I'm going to go to File, Export, Render Video. I'm going to title this North Trail for YouTube. Got my preset as YouTube 1080p, and I'm just going to hit Render. That's pretty damn cool no matter what side of the flat earth fence you're on. Now let's keep in mind that the stars were rotating in a counterclockwise motion. Let's turn around now, face south, and do the exact same thing. What did we see? Exactly what we predicted on a globe. The stars in the south are once again rotating in a circle, but this time clockwise instead of counterclockwise. And because we're in the northern hemisphere, we can't quite see the center of the circle. But guess what? The more south you travel, the higher the center of that circle will be in the sky. And once you cross the equator, you will see the center of that circle and it'll get higher in the sky the more south you go closer to the south pole. That's because on a globe, we do have a south pole. The stars in the center of the South Pole are completely different than the stars in the center of the North Pole. But if this is not interesting or convincing enough for you, let's see what happens when we look east. Now I find this one the most fascinating because where on a flat earth would you stand and watch the stars rotate in a counterclockwise circle on your left and a clockwise circle on your right? Let's analyze this one a little deeper. Let's look at what's going on. We've got things rotating very high on the left, which is north in a circle and down here close to the bottom on the right. But what we also see is right here, closer to the south, we've got a line where it's straight. It's not really rotating in a circle. It's almost a straight line right here, just in this tiny little area. Let's check out a video of the West now. This was taken with an even wider angle lens of 14 millimeters, so you're gonna be able to see more of the South and more of the North. And once again, on the left, which is South, we see things rotating clockwise and it's kind of low, whereas in the right, the North, we see things rotating counterclockwise and it's much higher. And once again, closer to the South, we've got this almost straight line that perfectly divides north and south. It's right around here. Where on the flat earth can you find a place where there is a line that perfectly separates the north and the south while facing east or west and the stars rotate in a circle one direction and a circle in the opposite direction on the other side? That line does not exist. It doesn't even make sense. But on a globe, we have such a line. It's called the equator. Anybody standing north of the equator will see that line south of them. Anybody standing south of the equator will see that line north of them. Anybody standing on the equator will see that line 
in the east or west right down the middle. Very basic concepts such as north, south, east, and west and how the stars rotate within those directions begin to break down and stop making sense on a flat earth, but are very easily observed, photographed, and explained on a globe. And that about wraps it up for this video. Whether you're into flat earth stuff or not, taking photographs of space is one of the most rewarding hobbies, and I invite you to subscribe to this channel and learn more about how to do it yourself. If you enjoyed this video, please give me a like and a comment. I'd love to know your thoughts on the flat earth debate. All right, everybody, as always, stay spacey, clear skies, and good night.